Well, good afternoon. Let's go ahead and get started with another CAMP 400 lecture. Two announcements, uh, both of them right up here. This week in lab, lab six, and we will do the rest of the labs in order. That goes seven, eight, nine, and 10. And uh, then we'll have the lab practical. For lab five, you'll have one more, one extra week to finish the calculations and turn it in. Um, and that does mean that labs five and six will both be due next week. Um, turn it in whenever you'd like for lab five. But my goal, and I think I expressed this to you in each of your lab sections last week, was to have you work the calculations for lab five correctly. And so I wanted to give you that extra week to check in with me and get feedback if you'd like. Um, lab six, it turns out, super exciting lab. Uh, but we do 80 to 90% of it during the lab time today. So there shouldn't be a lot of lab homework. A little bit, because there are a couple questions. But you, you actually have to do your calculations as you go, because the calculations for the first part of the lab affect your answer for later in the lab. So. Anyway, those are the two announcements. Where were we as far as lecture material? Well, we were talking about uh, coffee cup calorimeter type problems. We said there were two main types and we're gonna work both of those two uh, main types today. Um, one of them is a coffee cup calorimeter problem with a reaction. And the other was a coffee cup calorimeter problem with two materials and no reaction. And where we left off here was we had the reaction, we'd solved for the joules, the energy, Q solution um, associated with the heating up of the solution. And this number is positive. That means that the solution took in energy. That's how the temperature got higher. Now, uh, that means that the reaction must have given off energy. Uh, and so the reaction has a negative sign here because the reaction gave off energy. Now, where I'd like to pick up is for a Q reaction, Q reaction always looks like this type of equation. The Q reaction, or the E associated with the reaction, is equal to delta H reaction times moles and you'll see moles reacted, and we'll talk a bit about this as we go. And suffice it to say for now, that in this reaction things are simple, because everything has a one coefficient. And doesn't that make life simple? Yes, it does. Uh, we'll talk about non-one coefficients, as some of you saw today, this morning in discussion. Now, I have my Q reaction. It is minus 14,644, and I'll plug that in in a minute. What I don't have is my moles reacted. To find my moles reacted, I'm going to know that I have my volume and my molarity of my sodium hydroxide, my volume of my, and my molarity of my hydrochloric acid, and in fact, they're both the same. And so we can calculate the moles, and in fact, both of these are limiting reactants in this particular problem. So uh, it doesn't matter which one we choose. Um, in fact, I'm just going to take this 250 milliliters, convert it into liters, 0 0.2500 liters. Pretty simple, straightforward math. Uh, I get 0 0.250 moles. And I did that with sodium hydroxide. I could have done it with HCl for this particular problem. In future problems, in certain other discussions and homework, you'll see you, you have to find the limiting reactants. In this case, they're both. Any questions about that? Once you find the moles reacted, it goes right in here. Moles reacted, and uh, we have Q reaction. We have moles reacted. We can solve for delta H. I'm going to write it all in here.
and then rearrange to uh, solve for delta H reaction by dividing each side by 0 0.250. I get delta, uh, yes, good, I still have my minus sign. Whew. Uh, and when I do that, I get minus 58,576. Joules per mole. That's more sig figs than I usually carry. I always end up rounding down to three sig figs. I'm going to get minus, uh, and I will also convert it into kilojoules per mole. I will get minus 58.6 kilojoules per mole. As my final answer. It's rounded to three sig figs. Um, any questions about this? Okay. This involves a reaction, and um, that's about what we see. So 75% of the problems on exam two and on the final and on the homework involve a reaction, because this is chemistry class. Let's do another one involving a reaction. This one, the dissolving of ammonium nitrate is used in chemical cold baths. Uh, we'll be doing lab today, and we'll actually be uh, designing a chemical hot pack. So this is related. If a certain number of grams of ammonium nitrate is dissolved in 100 milliliters of water at 25 degrees Celsius, what is the final temperature of the solution? And I've given you delta H, and I haven't called it delta H reaction. Delta H reaction is if it's just a general reaction. If it's a specific reaction that we already know, like a dissolving reaction in this case, this is dissolving because it takes the solid, turns it into aqueous species. It's a strong electrolyte. It breaks up into ions 100%. So, like sometimes you'll see delta H something down here, and it just means we know what reaction it should be. I could have also called this delta H of neutralization, because this is a neutralization reaction between an acid and a base as well. So, uh, but if it's no, or if it's just a generic example, I'll just write delta H reaction. All right, so this is a dissolving reaction. We have our delta H. Since there's a reaction, almost reflexively, I write down my basis coffee cup calorimeter equation. And then from there, I start filling things in. Uh, my Q reaction term will look just like it does over here. So easy to forget this minus sign, but please don't. Keep the minus sign there. And the solution, well, it, the solution will be mass of solution times specific heat capacity of solution times temperature change of solution. Because there's only two types of terms. There's the Q reaction, and then there's Q solution, Q water, Q material. Anything that is changing temperature has to have this type of term. All right. Well, from there, let's see. So it, it, like so many things in Chem 400, once you understand which equation to use, you can then plug things in, and there should only be one thing left that you don't know. Of course, the question is making, figuring out what all those things are. I don't know about you. I work in joules. I'm a joule man. I, everything I do, like if I have kilojoules and joules, I work the problem in joules. Some people like kilojoules. I don't care, but you will see that I have a kilojoules here, and you will know that the specific heat of our solution, which will be the same specific heat of 
as of water will be 4.184 joules per mole degree Celsius. And so it doesn't matter as long, like you will get terribly incorrect answers if you have different sets of units in your problem. Did I mention I love units? Yeah, that's me. Oh. All right, so uh, I'm going to turn this into 25,700 joules per mole. My moles. I want to plug it in. I have grams. I can turn that into moles using the molar mass. So let's see. I'll do that up here. Molar mass of ammonium nitrate. Actually, this is embarrassing. All I have is the answer, so I don't have the molar mass. Do you believe me that I could calculate it? Okay. Then I'll just write the answer here. So 0 0.338 moles of ammonium nitrate. So I'll write that in. And again, everything's got a one coefficient. There's only one thing that we have moles of this time, so it's easy to figure out what moles to put in there. Our mass of solution. Well, our mass of solution is uh, going to be the mass of the water plus the mass of our ammonium nitrate. That's going to be 100. Well, this is 100 milliliters of water. How many grams will that be? That's going to be 100 grams of water. Plus our grams of ammonium nitrate. In fact, in lab this week, we'll do this as well. We'll measure the uh, volume of water using a graduated cylinder. We'll convert that into grams, then we'll add our grams of salt to get our mass of solution. In this case, it's 127.7.07. Don't let me forget my minus sign. doesn't say anything about it, but this is the solution, and you may assume that the solution has the same properties of water. That means we will use the specific heat of water here. So specific heat C sub S for our solution equals C sub S for water. Always an okay assumption to make. Oh, joules per gram degree Celsius, pardon me. And our temperature change. Well, uh, we know that our initial temperature is 25 degrees. We don't know what our final temperature is. That's what we're solving for. So we'll put TF. Minus 25.0 degrees Celsius. And so there's only one thing to do. There's solve for TF. You've got a whole bunch of numbers here. It is off to the Algebra Olympics, if you will. And um, and basically you just multiply everything out and I will tell you this so our final temperature 
since it's an ice pack, a cold pack, should be lower. If you forget the minus sign, it will be higher. So there's an indication of one common mistake. Um, good. How cold do ice packs get? Is this ice pack probably going to be negative 75 degrees Celsius? Not if it's a real ice pack. Is it going to be negative 24.99 degrees Celsius? Probably not as well. And one of the things I try and do is make these problems relatively true. So anyway, if you, if you leave this as 25.7 kilojoules and do this, you'll see the temperature change will be very, very tiny. That's an indication that you've got a heat issue. But otherwise, it's just algebra, and your final temperature will be 8.6 degrees Celsius. And I'll allow you to solve that, to practice your algebra. It'd be great if on your second exam, the algebra was a piece of cake, so you'll practice it as you do homework six quite a bit. Um, and then it'd be great if the, you know, we'll, we'll work on solving these and feel comfortable with the type of problem, too. Any questions about this? Why is it two sig figs? Why is it two sig figs? Good question. Um, see here, this temperature change will only go to the tenths place because of the way the problem. If you gave me three sig figs, always fine. It would have to go to the hundreds place then, but, um, and temperatures don't usually go to the hundreds place. Any other questions? All right. So that's two problems with reactions. There are also problems with materials. And here's a typical one. It says a 32.5 gram cube of aluminum initially at one temperature is submerged into a, uh, an amount of water at a different temperature. What is the final temperature of both substances at thermal equilibrium? Thermal equilibrium is a fancy way of saying that when you put two objects at different temperatures together, they end up at the same temperature, whatever that temperature is. So thermal equilibrium, in this case, just means that both objects have the same final temperature. Although equilibrium is a huge topic in Chemistry 401, it covers probably half to two-thirds of the class just talking about what different types of equilibrium are. Uh, you have one substance, aluminum. You have another substance, water. Aluminum and water have no known reactions that we do in Chem 400. So this is not, there's no Q reaction, there's no delta H reaction. And there's not even a solution. There's just water and aluminum. That says Al for Al, aluminum. Another hint about this type of problem is that you have two initial temperatures. If you have two initial temperatures, then you have to have two of these delta T expressions. I'm going to write them all out now. Equal sign in the middle, mass of aluminum, specific heat of aluminum, delta T of aluminum. I'm just going to write my delta T of aluminum as T final minus my initial temperature. Well, actually, I'll write it out. I'll write it out like this, and then I'll fill it up. Don't forget the minus sign. W is going to stand for water this time. 
I said this a couple times this morning in discussion. I'll probably say it uh, a couple times in Wednesday on discussion, and I might as well say it now. This minus sign, all it means is that if one thing's hotter, it is giving off energy, heat, and the other thing is taking in heat. And this minus sign accounts for the difference in the direction of energy flow. It could be here, it could be here, it doesn't matter. It doesn't mean that one thing is giving off energy and the other is taking it in. It just means mathematically there's a difference in the direction of energy flow. And just like we've seen a little bit already, and we will see more in a few minutes, if something is exothermic, then energy is given off and the delta H is negative. And something's endothermic, the delta H is positive, and that is a difference in the direction of energy flow as well. All right, so I got my mass and my aluminum. Uh, given specific uh, heat capacity of aluminum. Sort of went all the way over here, but got it all in one line. There's only one unknown, it is the final temperature. You've got to distribute, you've got to collect terms. Who knew the case? It's not a math class, but sometimes it seems like it. Now, a um, couple things about this. So, did I forget something? I forgot my minus sign. So easy to do. Don't be like Bill. Don't forget your minus sign. So include that. Um, and if you forget the minus sign, your final temperature either comes out below 15.4 or above 45.8, which is physically impossible. It's got to be between those two temperatures. Um, now, here's what I wanted to do before I realized I forgot my minus sign. Do you see these two numbers here? How do they compare to these two numbers? Are they bigger or small? They're small. That means that if these two are bigger, not only is there more mass, but it takes more energy per mass to heat it up. Your final temperature should be closer to 15.4 than 45.8. Okay? So there is, so what we want to build up is an idea about what our answer should be. First off, it has to be between our two initial temperatures. Second off, if these two numbers are bigger, then it has to be closer to 15.4 than 45.8. Any questions about that? Because okay. you'll see some of the multiple choice questions ask about those kinds of things. If two materials have the same mass but different specific heat capacities, how will the temperature change? Anyway. The other thing is, it's so easy to mess up the math here. There are so many numbers. One of the things I do is I don't carry my units through the calculation. I just assume that they're correct. I, well, anyway, um, whether you believe me or not, nothing on my sleeve but algebra today. You should get 17.3 degrees Celsius if you do all the algebra for this. And indeed, the final temperature is much closer. 
in fact, holy cow, like this is like if I multiply these two numbers together, I get less than 32. If I multiply these two numbers together, I get something like over 400. That's 10 times bigger number just if I multiply these two together. No wonder it's only two degree change versus 25 degree change. All right. If there are no questions, then we'll continue. Uh, number 28 is a, uh, a companion problem. Please work that in the privacy of your own home. Now on to relationships involving delta H reaction. To recap, in the lecture notes, we have one way to find delta H. Do a coffee cup calorimeter type problem. And we will do that today, or this week in lab. But there are still two other ways, and I think we're going to cover both of them, both of those ways today. But before we talk about the next one, we have to talk about relationships involving delta H reaction. Uh, one, if the reactants and products of a reaction are switched, the sign of delta H reaction changes. Does that sound familiar? That is in your lecture notes. Uh, I'm going to do the same example I already did to make to drive home the example. It took propane and burned it. And for that process, we said delta H reaction. That's a giant G for some reason. We said delta H reaction was minus 2,044 kilojoules per mole. And then we said if we flip the reactants and products, we put the CO2s. as reactants, and we put the propane and oxygen as the products. We get the same number, but opposite sign. Plus sign could be omitted, but added for effect. Plus 2044. And further, what we said before was that if the process is exothermic, that's what delta H negative means, that means that the reaction gives off energy, and that means that the reactants have a higher potential energy than the products. That's why it gives off energy. Just like my pen, if I drop it from a higher energy, higher potential energy position to a lower potential energy position, it gives off energy. Any questions about that? If not, B, if the coefficients in a chemical reaction are multiplied by a constant, then delta H reaction is multiplied by a constant. For this one, I'm going to take this reaction, and I'm going to multiply everything times 2, so 2 propanes, 10 oxygens. goes to six carbon dioxides and eight water vapors. When I double the coefficients, I double the delta H reaction. Delta H reaction for this one, the one that I'm writing in green, will be minus 4,088 kilojoules per mole.
And that's legit. I know in Chem 300 and earlier in Chem 400, you would say, well, couldn't this be simplified? And the answer is yes, but we're going to complicate things by multiplying everything by two because it will make future things easier. Uh, questions about that? Then uh, let me do another case. By the same token, if I cut everything in half, so I have half propane plus 2.5 oxygen, Also legit, I cut my delta H in half. Delta H reaction for this process, minus 1,022 kilojoules per mole. Delta H reaction for this, cut it, the coefficients in half. Cut the delta H reaction in half, minus 1,022 kilojoules per mole. Now, a couple points that I'd like to make here. One is half coefficients are legit because you can have half a mole. You still can't have half a molecule, but pretty much everything we're doing now is in terms of moles, so that's okay. You can't have half a mole. Um, and if you remember those questions that we did where I had you draw the molecules and draw the products, that was to emphasize that you cannot have half molecules. You either have a whole molecule or not. Now we're going to lose. You can't have half of them. Um, the other thing is, you can see all of these reactions are related to each other. And so every time the coefficient changes, every time you flip reactants and products, you get a different number here. They are all related, it's true. So if you get something and then get asked about something else, if, if anything changes, yeah, change. So figure out how to find that. Now let's talk about our second way to find delta H reaction. It's a method called uh, Hess's Law. Hess's Law says that if two chemical reactions, chemical reactions are added, then the delta H reaction values can be added as well. And these problems all look like this. Given a whole bunch of reactions, could be two, could be three, calculate the delta H reaction for the unknown process, the unknown reaction. This one has three reactions that you're adding up. I'm actually going to take a minute and move on to the next one. Because this one's simpler, and then we'll come back to that one. Sorry they're out of order, but I think this will be a better process for us. What I want to do is I want to make this reaction out of these two, right? Nothing on my sleeve this time. I'm going to attempt to work without my notes. It's a little like a trapeze artist working without a net, so hopefully I will not fall and perish. We'll see. All right, so uh, although I may need help with the math. So. Uh, it says calculate delta H reaction for the reaction below. And before I do that, let me answer the question, why? Why are we doing this? Why am I putting you through this personal hell? The answer is that sometimes chemists can't do a reaction or think they might want to do a reaction, but they're not sure. 
but they can use results from reactions that they can do to imagine what the energy will be for this process. That's why we're doing it. And this comes up a lot in biology. In biology, things are much more complicated than in chemistry, especially since they involve uh, humans and animals. And so you could have reactions that you know, and you could hypothesize a reaction that you're not sure if it will happen, and you'll want to estimate the delta H reaction to see if it's exothermic or not. So that's why we're doing this. Now, um, now let me go over how to do this. You see the two CuCl solid? It's a product. It's a product right here. So in order to build this reaction, I'm going to write this out exactly as it is. That's an arrow. Now, I have my CuCl2 solid, my copper 2 chloride, as a reactant, and up here it's a product. I'm going to flip reactants and products and change the sign of my delta H. And what Hess's law says is that I can now add these reactions and add their delta H reactions to get an overall process. Does anything cancel out? Well, let me say that again. If some, sorry, <laughs> I have chlorine gas as a reactant on my top reaction. I have chlorine gas as a product in my bottom reaction. That means you can cancel them out. And the reason you can do that is because those chlorines, whatever their energy is, whatever their potential energy, it will be the same on the product and reactant side. One thing to think about is the things we're doing right now for thermochemistry and delta H and half moles were all done, or principally all done, before they knew molecules really were atoms and things like that. They were do done in quantities. And so you can think of these two, the chlorines, having the same amount of energy, and it's really their energy canceling. Well, I canceled them out. Is there anything else that cancels out? One of the coppers as well. Meaning that their energy canceled out. And then you write what's left. I've got one copper plus copper two chloride. Goes to two copper two chlorides. Wait a minute. Sorry, copper one chloride. Yeah. I'm right above here. And the energy. For that process is 170 kilojoules per mole. That's positive. That is an endothermic process.
which means that for this process to occur, energy has to be put in. Now this is the previous page, page 30. And it says, calculate the delta interaction for the reaction given below. We've got this. We've got three different reactions. And this is the more complicated example. But um, let's see. Do you like puzzles? Do you ever play puzzles in your free time? These are puzzles. And so a couple things I will say about puzzles. And we may see this today, because again, I'm working without my notes. If you work on a puzzle, and at least when I work on a puzzle like this, if I get stuck, I erase everything and start from scratch, or I get a new piece of paper. Because you can go down the rabbit hole on these, and end up like, oh, no, I'll cancel this. Oh, I'll add another reaction, I'll cancel this. And you'll end up with six reactions when if there's only three reactions, there should only be a max of three reactions in your problem to answer. Um, that's who we got here. Next thing is, when I see something that is only one place up here, it has to be, okay, this is a product, this is a product, I have to write it at least with this as a product. Now I see there's a four there, but a two there. The trick I have is, I can take this reaction, multiply the coefficients times one half, multiply the delta H reaction times one half, and then write it down here. And there's a good bet that that'll be part of the answer. Working with that and that here, but I think I nailed that math. And I remembered my minus sign as well. Alright, so so far so good. I've got my two H NO3s on my product side. Uh, NO2. Well, the only place I have NO2 is up here. NO2 is a reactant. NO2 is a product. I'm gonna flip it. The flipping for me. And I'll do this in red. Means that there's a minus sign involved. Because I have to change the sign of my delta H. Now that's not all. I have a 2 here, and I have a 3 there. This is where I get nervous. But it looks to me like I have to multiply it times 1.5. So this minus 1.5 means flip it and multiply it times 1.5. So that's what I will attempt to do. Uh, it doesn't mean that the coefficients end up negative. The other thing I try and do uh, to keep myself organized for these is line up my arrows. That way I know what's reactants and products. So I have, now I have three NOs. Ooh, I'm 
174, and it's positive. Now, I zoned in on the things that were only on one side down here. I can see oxygens in all three of these reactions. And so oxygens are going to be the last thing I want to think about. Because if the process works, we'll, we'll worry about those last. All right, so I got one reaction left. I need one NO over here. I have any? Oh, I have three NOs already. So I need to get rid of two NOs. So I'm going to try a minus one. Or just a minus sign. And let's see what happens. I don't know. Uh, and there's another, so, and you could actually just write everything out and then cancel it out, but I'm going to try and cancel stuff as I go here. I do have two NOs and three NOs, so I can cancel two of them and leave one. I have one nitrogen and one nitrogen. Good, those cancel because there's no nitrogen gases in my product react, in my end reaction. Let's see. I have, this is one oxygen plus 1.5 is 2.5 of them. Now I have three NO2s plus one H2O goes to two nitric acids and one nitrogen oxide. Nitrogen oxide. Right. And then I add up my different pieces here, and you should get minus 137 kilojoules per mole. That is our second method for for finding delta H reaction. The and what is and and why are we so interested in this? Because that's going to tell us the heat given off or taken in by a reaction, which is a big deal. Um, and it's also related to changes in potential energy, which will also be useful as well. So, any questions about that? All right, so there's two examples. There's a third way to find delta H reaction based on standard enthalpies of formation. Ooh. Do you want me to leave this? Does anybody want me to leave this up here? Okay. There we go. We'll do it over here. Standard enthalpies of formation. So uh, all values of delta H reaction are relative. Ooh. 
There are no absolute values of delta H reaction. We had talked a little bit about this. We said that all changes in energy are based on the difference in energy between the reactants and products. We said we also always do products minus reactants. Um, and we said that there's no, uh, they're all relative, there are no absolute values in the same way that there's no absolute value in height. The floor is just zero, we can call it zero. We can call certain things zero energy, but it just means that's, a, we're calling it zero, it's a reference point. Uh, the most convenient reference point for each element is the lowest energy form of each element at 25 degrees Celsius, one atmosphere for gases, one molarity for aqueous species, and pure liquids and solids. Okay. Now, uh, why is this the most convenient reference point? Well, if you're looking at the lowest energy form of each element at, uh, at these conditions, which are essentially room temperature conditions, then you can probably get most, but not all, but most elements, so that's convenient. And then um, what, we'll, what this will allow us to do is it's going to establish the floor, meaning the zero for each element. And then each form of the element will either be higher than the floor or lower than the floor. But now we have a floor established. And you can be, and, and we'll see, a lot of things are lower than the floor. It just means they're lower energy than the, the at, under these conditions. We also know the lowest energy form of most elements by looking at the periodic table that's hanging in the room. For bromine, what's the lowest energy form of bromine at room, uh, at 25 degrees Celsius, uh, atmospheric pressure, basically room temperature? Let me see. I think it's 23 in here, but can we call it close enough? Do you have your car temperature gauge set to degrees Celsius or Fahrenheit? Mine's in degrees Celsius. So I've been getting used to degrees Celsius uh, for the, you know, because eventually I believe we will change. May not be like but back to the question, bromine, lowest, for, lowest energy form of bromine under these conditions. It's bromine too, because we know it's diatomic. It's liquid because it's blue, right? Yeah. So, uh, gold, lowest energy form. Somebody else. What do the black letters mean? Solid. Is gold diatomic? No. So it's just going to be AU solid. And if you look up AU solid, on the internet, because I don't think this value is on the table of values on your conversion and equation sheet, but if you look it up, you'll see delta HF, that's for formation, equals zero. We'll talk about the formation aspect in a minute. You'll also see this little zero right there, which is called naught. This little zero, and the pronunciation would be Delta HF naught means under standard conditions. <coughs> naught means under standard conditions. And chemistry is like an onion. There are layers of understanding. The first layer of understanding is that we will always use these values even if we're not at standard conditions.
we will always use these values. And, and you'll see, sometimes I don't even put on the dot, and sometimes I do, because we will always use these values. Now, next thing is why. Why do we use these values? One, it's so we can actually solve problems, even if we're not at standard conditions. Let's say you're doing a combustion. Is that combustion happening at 25 degrees Celsius? No, probably one atmosphere though, although you could imagine that if you burned something in a closed container, that does become a bomb, and that's interesting too. Pressures would be different than one atmosphere. But it's not at 25 degrees Celsius. But there's no other way to do it. So that's, it's a practical reason. Then there's the other point, which is delta H values are related to potential energies. Potential energies at different temperatures, say for a propane molecule, if you have propane, I could draw a propane from that If you have propane and the C is bonded to the C and it's at 25 degrees or 50 degrees or 1,000 degrees, the potential energy is approximately the same because the positions are approximately the same. So we always use these values even if we are not at standard conditions because it allows us to solve problems. That's a practical consideration. But what I'm going to write here is because the potential energy and therefore delta H values are not that dependent on temperature. They don't change much. Well, I'll say, I'll put it this way, because potential energy values and delta H values, these two are related. Don't change much as temperature changes. Uh, saying that and it's worth knowing is that they're largely temperature independent and if you needed to account for the temperature dependence of these variables you would be a junior level in chemistry or biology and taking that level of um, the next level of chemistry and biology beyond that stuff. so anyway any questions about that? they establish a floor Incidentally, I'm trying to teach our donkeys math. And so they do this sometimes. So uh, like, I'm like, what's, you know, like, I'll ask them, they'll do five of those, and I'll be like, what's, oh, oh, right, what's two plus three? It's, it's not working. Anyway, and so every time I do that, I think about our donkeys. Uh, okay, so now we're not quite done here yet. There's one other thing I want to say. At least one other thing. Let's talk about oxygen gas. Is oxygen gas the lowest energy form of oxygen? It's red, that means it's a gas. It's diatom, it's one of the seven diatomics. Yes. We look up on our table, we will see delta HF kilojoules per mole, O2, gas. Zero kilojoules per mole. It is the floor. For oxygen by itself, now let's look at a couple other values. Let's look at O. Yeah, it's what we might call atomic oxygen. If what I've told you is true, it must be positive because it must have higher energy. Oh, good. Two forty-nine point two. Yes. 
also an elemental form of oxygen must be higher in energy. Ozone also must be higher in energy, 142.7. Now let's go below the floor for a compound. And the question will come up, why do compounds form? And the answer will be, if you take the elements and you make a compound, that compound better be lower in energy. That's why it forms. Let's do H2O. Do you have a favorite phase of H2O, solid, liquid, or gas? Liquid. Winter's coming up. Ski season could be solid. Delta HF uh, minus two eighty five point eight. So if we were to think about water as compared to oxygen and what about hydrogen what would the hydrogen what would hydrogen's delta hf value be that's hydrogen gas h2 zero. zero so if you take hydrogen gas and oxygen gas and make water you lower the energy of those atoms by 285.8 kilojoules per mole per mole of water so there's some coefficients in there to think about why do bonds form? Why do compounds form? It is to lower the energy of the species in bonds. We have a lot more to say about that, but that's one place this is showing up. Not that we've even talked about how to do a Lewis structure yet. Anyway, any questions about that? Okay. Uh, let me see, I may, I know I'm running out of space. I've long ago run out of space. Um, yeah, I'll stop there. And we'll go on to the next slide. Delta H reaction values can be determined from delta HF values. This is the third way to determine delta H reaction. There's a table of delta HF values on the conversion equation sheet. There are also any ones that you need that are not on this list can be found online. And it turns out that for your thermochemistry discussion this week, I built this list into it. The general formula is going to be the delta H reaction equals, are you familiar with this? This is the uppercase Greek letter sigma. It means sum. And it says the sum of the coefficients times delta H. Please change that to F for formation of your products. Minus the sum of the co coefficients times delta H F of your reactants. I apologize for that. Here's one from the discussion sheet this week. Photosynthesis. Question for you. Is photosynthesis endothermic or exothermic? Well, good. Then this is a real question, right? Uh, so here's a chemist version of photosynthesis. Take carbon dioxide and water, turn them into glucose and oxygen. What we need to do for this is look up all the delta HF values. We're going to have them with our little naught symbol because they're from standard conditions. And they'll all be in kilojoules per mole. And so if I get my list over here, Carbon dioxide, minus 393.5. 
H2O, H2O liquid, I'm glad it's your favorite, but there are all three phases on there, so be careful that you get the right one. Uh, H2O liquid, minus 285.8. Glucose, uh, I don't have glucose aqueous. I just have glucose solid. So that'll have to be close enough. We're practical people here, aren't we? Well, there's probably a little difference between aqueous and solid, um, but we're gonna use solid this time because that's what we have. And oxygen, well, we already know what oxygen is. It's just zero. Okay, and now let's use this formula. This formula says sum the coefficients, six for uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, and that's a minus, so make sure you put your minus in there. Plus, six times negative 285.8 kilojoules per mole. And then it says subtract off the coefficients times the delta HF values for the reactants. One for the coefficient times the value. Wait a minute. I'm totally screwing this up, aren't I? My whole thing says products. It's supposed to be products minus reactants. And I've already taken up most of my space, but start with products. I apologize. So it's products times coefficients. My other product is six coefficients. times zero kilojoules per mole, my favorite kind of math. And now I'm gonna put this stuff down here. for that. It should always be products minus reactants. It's always final state minus initial state. And lo and behold, when I add all this up, I get 2,802.5 kilojoules per mole that's a very positive number. Is this reaction endothermic or exothermic? This is a very endothermic reaction. Why does, so endothermic processes tend not to happen because you're starting from low energy and you're trying to make things higher energy. Why does photosynthesis occur then? Where does the energy come from? The sun, yeah, it's brilliant. And this is one example you take, and it's, you know, it's complicated, but you can make endothermic reactions occur with energy input. That energy, in this case, comes from the sun. 
And it's a lot of energy. That is a large number. Anyway, any questions about this? This is your third way to determine dense H reaction. Coffee cup calorimetry, Hess's law, starting with delta H F values. All right. What else is left then? More examples. These are companion problems for you to work. Delta H reaction and reaction energy diagram. So using the last example, this is the reaction we did just here. Okay, we went to solid instead of aqueous. We'll give you that. If we draw a reaction energy diagram for this process, which we will do over here. Remember, a reaction energy diagram has potential energy on the uh, y-axis. In Chem 400 and Chem 401, we tend to put reaction progress on the x-axis. What that means is that just the reactants are somewhere on the left, and as the reaction progresses towards products, you get products on the right. And when, when you get to organic chemistry, you know what they'll put here? Because they do the exact same thing. They'll put reaction coordinate. But in either case, it means the same thing. Always put the reactants on the left, always put the products on the right. We said for this reaction, delta H twenty-eight point oh, uh, sorry, two thousand eight hundred two point five kilojoules per mole. Put the reactants down here. Put the products up top on the right. The difference in energy between these two is delta H. And as the homework says, please label it just like that when you do the homework. Now, typically, I like to draw between these two, two sets of arrows. You don't have to draw that. The thing that I would remember too is this number is products minus reactants. So the fact that it's positive means that your products have this much more potential energy than your reactants. And the sun, in this case, gives it that potential energy. Oh, this was a little out of the way. Now let's talk is uh, when energy is a product. I can make energy a product, nothing up my sleeve, if I turn these two and flip those as the reactants. Minus 2802. This is an exothermic reaction. Do they have a name for this in biology as well? Could call it respiration or it's uh, burning of glucose is really what the reaction is. 
But in biology, it takes like 99 zillion steps to do this. But we'll consider the chemistry version. And I just wanted to draw you a reaction energy diagram for an exothermic process. You still have your reactants. Your reactants are now your glucose and your six oxygens. your delta H reaction, which is products minus reactants. Products are a lower number, so when you do the subtraction, you get negative. And we don't necessarily have to know what these numbers are. These axes never have numbers on them. Now, you can put them on if you want, but I wouldn't. Okay. Uh, no wonder we transport in glucose around our body. Look at all that fabulous energy we can get from this. Nice job. Right. Uh, I think that's all right. We'll pick up there next time. Just a tiny bit of chapter six left, so we will finish up those last couple slides on Wednesday. Then we will start chapter seven, which is perfect timing because next week is when we do our lab on chapter seven. I will also have chapter seven homework for you on Wednesday. Any questions? Ah. Um, let me stop this, Sarah.